kids or you aren't going to hold people to some sort of standard of like you have to be in doing this for 25 years and then we'll let you do this other thing, then we have to vote and support those candidates, right? We can't just say business as usual. We have to work hard and really rally, bring five of our friends to the polls, right? Like we have to do that work if that's the thing that we want to see happen. Yeah, definitely. And you've also had the advantage of being in both Black Wall Streets, well, in the sense of being near Tulsa and definitely being in Durham. So I was just wondering, in just being a researcher, and a, if what your comparison of those two places are. A lot of people talk about those being the great Black Wall Streets of, hist- of history, but you've actually seen both of them as they are now. So I just wonder if you can make some comparison as to how they are and what their similarities are, what their differences are, in the way that they've been developed after being two of the historical Black Wall Streets, because we know there were a number of Black Wall Streets around the country. Right. So I'll be honest, I haven't been to Tulsa yet, because I've only lived in Oklahoma since July, and I just haven't had time, but it's on my list. I mean, I've done a lot of reading, and obviously, we, you know, I've taught about it, because it's just part of the, you know, things that we sort of talk about here. Um, you know, so I, I don't really have a comparison. I will say that I still think there's still so much potential um, for black entrepreneurship and like black uplift in Durham. Um, and so just trying to be strategic and smart and thoughtful about the way we implement those things, right? Because economic development is coming. And that I should say that's one thing I really appreciated about Pierce when he ran for council in 2017 is that he also, I should say his campaign in the, the local election was also such a love letter to black Durham, right? Like I can remember going to every candidate forum and he just re- reminded us about how much money had been, you know, put into such a small radius in the city of Durham and, and that downtown block. Um, and he, he kept us honest about some of the numbers about the black people, black and Latinx people that were being evicted. Um, and I think that he was also very, very aware um, of sort of, you know, the city is changing, right? And so how do we, how do we keep the history that we know and love? I mean, I love the history of Durham. I love the city of Durham. Um, and I love what it, it meant for me just as a young black professional um, to, to get to live there, to buy my first home there, right. To know that that's just, that's, that, that can happen in a place like Durham, right. And that that's the history that we have, you know, economic power in a, in a place. And I think that's really important. And so um, I think, you know, as we, the thing about Tulsa right now, obviously is, you know, this is the, or next year, this year, next year is like the hundred years since the uh, race massacre. And so a lot of people, have turned their eyes on, on Tulsa. One of my colleagues does research on Tulsa. Um, and so it's just such an interesting thing to think about. It's not that, you know, we didn't have a, a, a massacre in the city of Durham, but there were so many economic development um, programs and urban um, renewal, right, that took, took out our neighborhoods, um, you know, building 147, right? And so it's, it, it wasn't a massacre in the same sense, but it was a devastation of, of the black community, right? And so you do wonder, what could have happened if, if, if we had sort of not done, made those decisions. And so I do think it's important to think about the council's role um, even today is like, you know, what are we doing to make sure that there's still black entrepreneurship in a city where black entrepreneurship was born, right? Like you think about the, the NC Mutual, that's a, I mean, that's an amazing story of, of, of entrepreneurship, right? And the outputs that come from that, that endeavor in terms of, um, Hillside High, right, North Carolina Central, um, Lincoln Hospital, right, when you think about the outputs in terms of what it meant to, to be black at that time, those are good things. So how do we maintain that? How do we make sure that Durham stays within that tradition, not to be old school, right, we can be innovative and we can still be forward thinking, but, you know, we should have, you know, that same, like, we should be able to still maintain that, that historical black entrepreneurial spirit and be able to own the businesses in our community, and you know, those types of things. Yeah, definitely. And I um I was just coming back to the presidential politics and everything. Were you surprised or did you listen to the debate and have you followed the analysis? But it seems to me that Biden made a promise to deliver a black woman to the the Supreme Court. Some people are already speculating that that's Kamala Kamala. And and then he also said he was gonna get a woman in office. I've heard everybody from Elizabeth Warren to um the uh, Amy to uh, Amy K to uh, after now hearing people proud of the idea that it could be Stacey Abrams. So I just wondered what your right. thoughts are. What were you surprised that he made that kind of a commitment to go that far? I mean, because I know one of the other articles that you wrote was about the power of uh, 
women of color and how they are starting to have even more of a role on the national political landscape. And with him making that promise, that definitely seems to um, validate that kind of stance. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a strong um, step, and I think it's a strong signal. I mean, I will say, I, I, you know, hopefully he's more thoughtful, right, because you can think about 2008 with McCain picking um, Sarah Palin, right, sort of, I think he hoped it would be like, oh, look, we put a woman, it's any, you know, any woman, everyone's just going to support her. I think that's not going to be true, right? So I think he needs to be strategic. Um, yes, would I like to see him pick Warren? Absolutely. I think she's competent. I think she has a plan for everything. Um, but, you know, there's also, people, you know, obviously people were not, you know, not quite ready for her at the presidential level. I don't know what that means at the vice presidential level. Of course, Abrams is very popular. She has a national profile. Um, people seem to like her. And to be fair, she almost won her election, right? It's hard to imagine that if there weren't for the, you know, people being removed from voter rolls, that we might, she might already hold office, right? So I think that's important. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Kamala would, you know, could potentially be a good Supreme Court nominee. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I just hope it's thoughtful, right, going back to something I said earlier, like, don't just pander. Don't just think, oh, I'll look cool if I nominate a woman. Like, no, pick the right woman, the right woman that's going to bring something to your um, administration, the right woman that's going to be a good partner for you that you can work with, and that we know, if you know, together – you two are going to bring the country forward, right? And thinking about even what Obama picked Biden, I think those were some of the things that he thought about in picking Biden as a running mate, right? Like, here's some things that, that Joe Biden is good at or better. He has this experience. He can, he can do these things. That's a good partner for my presidency, right? Not just a scheme or a scam or some sort of, you know, thing, that, you know, a novel thing that gets people allegedly to, to, to vote for me. I think that's probably not a good plan. I think it should be thoughtful, um, and I'm obviously interested in it, um, but, yep. you know, it still needs to be the, the right person. And I would say that for any, I mean, whoever he picks, I hope it's the right person that we can really see, okay, this administration together, I can see how they're going to move us forward on X, Y, and Z. Yeah, because I, I know some people, and I was even one of them, who were thinking that it could have been um, just because she's been such an advocate in the um House, not in the Senate, but in the House, that it could be Alexandria uh, Cortez, who you mentioned earlier. But then I'd forgotten, I had forgotten. I knew that there was a 35-year-old rule for the president, but friends of mine had told me that that same rule exists for the vice president. I don't know if that's the case or not, but that's what friends have told me, that that 35-year-old rule exists for both of those positions. So I haven't done the research to see if that's actually the case. I don't know if you know that's the case or not, but I do know that I did look it up and see that it was the rule for the president. I'm not sure if it's the rule for the vice president. I don't know off the top of my head either. That's like beyond me. But I do. I mean, I think he has some good choices. And like I said, I hope he was serious about it, right? I hope he wasn't just saying it to, I don't know, pander. But again, I still think it needs to be the right woman, um, if that's if that's the sort of the route he's going to take. Um, and uh, you know, I think well, we all have baggage, so, right? So I think it could go either way. But I hope he's just thoughtful and really, again, thinking about. It as a team effort of like together we can move this our administration forward. I think that's a better approach than like oh if I do this I'll pick up X Y and Z voters. Like I don't know if that's true because surely there are some women who don't like any three you know any of those women right or there's people of color that don't like any of those women of color right like so I think it just needs to be um, well thought out and sort of I I would want to be able to see oh this is a good match right because then I also heard someone today saying oh he should pick Bernie Sanders as his running mate. And I was like, what? I don't, I don't know if that's going to happen. Right. So I think people are just speculating and obviously um, I I would need to to have a little more information about it before I was like, that's a good idea or not. Yeah. I understand. And and I just looked it up. It does say because the vice president could be president at any moment, the same requirements do apply. So you have to be 35 years old and a natural and a natural born citizen. So it does look like that 35 year old rule does exist for the uh, vice president as well. Now, in all your research that you've been doing on this kind of political front, and I've referenced a couple of the articles that you've written, both about German politics and on the national level and everything, what are some of the things that have surprised you the most? Because I'm sure that as you've been doing this research for a number of years, both here as well as now in Oklahoma, and like you said, you spent time in California, in New Jersey. So what has, have been some of the things that if somebody had asked you before you got into research and started doing this kind of work on a regular basis, they'd ask you what 
did, something that you did not expect to find that you have found that really shocked you, whether it was on the presidential side, whether it's the way that we handle politics. I know I get the feeling that you're not the biggest fan, and I know I'm not either of the Electoral College, but what are some of the things that have surprised you that you uh, as you've been doing your various research? Um, I think the number one thing, and if any of my friends are listening, no one will be surprised at this, is I think local politics is the most important politics that we should be more engaged in, and voter turnout is historically low, even though your day-to-day life is much more impacted by what happens at your local level than any other level, right? And so I think the flip side of that is also the unprecedented access that we have to our local elected officials, right? You can go to any school board meeting. You can show up to the county commission, and you can go to the, the city council. You can just sign up. You get to talk three minutes. We can't show up to Congress and ask for that. We can't just show up to a meeting for the president and ask for that, right? Um, you might be able to do it some of your legislat- with your, leg- your state legislators, right? Like that might be, you, have, you can maybe set up an appointment. But I just think local politics, it, just, it affects our day-to-day lives. And if, if they have a bad trash contract, your trash isn't picked up. If they haven't you know, allocated the right budget for stormwater runoff, you might have a problem. If your sidewalk needs repair, that's what you need to ask to fix it. That will affect your day-to-day life, and yet turnout hovers 18%, 20%, right? And so I think the thing that I have always just been shocked by is, wow, people really just don't care about these local politics, even though that's your real life right there. Every, every you know, first and third Monday or whatever your city, whatever your council votes or meets, you know? So I think that would be the one thing is just like, you know, if you, you know, people say, oh, voting doesn't matter. It can really matter in a local election because not enough people are voting in them. And it is my lifelong goal to increase voter turnout at the local level. So I encourage my students. It's just something I say to them. I'm like, you don't care today, but when you sort of find the community that you love, become active in it. Be a local voter, right? Vote in every random local election and, and do it as informed as possible because it really does make a difference in your life, right? They set your your, your property taxes, right? They decide how much, you know, in, in a city like Durham, they set the budget that's going to be transferred to the school board, right, to the, right, to the county, right? So the, the city, the taxes come from the city, right? And so part of that budget relationship matters. And, you know, you can attend those budget hearings. Um, and so, well, I guess the county, right? They work, the, the city and the county work together, but still, right? Like, I mean, we don't, again, we don't get to show up to Congress and just tell them how we feel about our, our national budget. Um, so I think just encouraging people to, to sort of be more engaged with local politics, um, given the low turnout that we see. Um, and obviously a city like Durham is better than some places. I want to say maybe like Dallas is like under 6% of people vote. Um, wow. That's really low. I mean, maybe it went up recently because I know they just had some elections, but um, yeah, there was a time where like there was a chart that was floating around and it was just very low. So, um, and that's just unfortunate because those elections matter. They do matter. And I know we've had a couple of other politician people as well as uh, academic type that have been on the show. And we've been trying to figure out, like I said, a lot of people are frustrated with the electoral college. If you could change something about the electoral college, would you, we just abandon the electoral college and you know, we go to a popular vote? Do you think that we'll get to a point where, it becomes like we use the tools like the internet, which then would treat some people like because it would increase voter turnout. But then some people are also like, they, we thought the Russians cheated on the Trump election. Just imagine what they could do if we're doing it online. Yeah, I mean, I think the Electoral College is, I, I don't know. I go back and forth because I understand what the founders were thinking, although I'm not sure that they thought it all the way through, right? And, you know, to be fair, Right. It was the the system was set up at a time where like even black people weren't counted fully as people, right? So it's like we're in slavery times and it's the three fifths rule and so there you know, it was designed to sort of make sure that, you know, the South didn't get over representation, um, in terms of how we vote and, you know, sort of but now we all can vote, um in some ways, you know, we all have access to the same things. So I don't know if it's as necessary as possible. And now that I live in a state, right, like we're never going to see the presidential candidates again this election. They're done, at least the Democratic ones, right, because Oklahoma is going to go red. And so they're not going to spend their time and effort here, right? And so that feels frustrating because I still have to live here, um, right? So then what can I do? I'm basically just going to focus on down ballot, right? I have a friend who's running for sheriff. 
I have, you know, you know, we flipped a seat here in Oklahoma, not me, but like I live here, but they flipped a seat. Um, her reelection is, is iffy. I'm going to try to support her campaign. 